It's that time again. Hello everyone and welcome to yet another Lionel Catalog Review. It's, as you can see at the time recording this on the bottom, it is 4.04 time, which is a nice little tribute to LAR 404. Didn't really tend to do that, but apologies for getting a little bit of a late start on this. I've just been working all-nighter after all-nighter on the Northeast Commuter Railroad Iceberg. That is a massive project that... Just when I think I'm done with it, I find another fact, I add in more information, I rearrange the order of a few things, edit this, fix that, and it's really been adding up where it would take something like 10 hours just to work on a single level of script, not even all the photos or editing, just working on the script for that. So that is taking a long time, but it is definitely worth the wait. It's definitely going to be my largest project ever, the largest thing I've ever worked on in the history of the channel, but it has so many cool facts about the entire Northeast region, not just one row, but all seven in the upper Northeast. But that's basically explaining what I've been working on for a little bit, so I just need a little bit of a rest after doing two all-nighters back-to-back. So, again, apologies if this is kind of late in the day, but nevertheless, here we are, right in front of the Lionel Volume 1 catalog. This is the big one. This is where they have all the new models, all the new releases for the year, some that might be released like six or seven months later or maybe the next year. But the thing with Lionel is that especially since the tooling for these models is very intricate, usually they release them about a year or two early. So this way they know how many pre-orders there are. So this way they know how many they want to produce. So this way you're not making more models and nobody ends up buying them. And I've even heard some people say that if not enough requests are made, then it ultimately doesn't get purchased. Or doesn't get built but with all that out of the way starting off is our front cover i mean this is the 20th anniversary of the polar express and that is a very nice logo on the top but i think we all saw this coming i guess because the polar express it single-handedly saved the model railroading industry in my opinion because ever since the polar express was made that is a great movie in itself but ever since that was made. Lionel jumped on the opportunity to make thousands upon thousands of Polar Express train sets to the point where you even see a Polar Express around every model train, every model tree. What am I saying? Every Christmas tree at the bottom of every tree. Every Christmas time model train display. I even have a Polar Express. I think two of them, actually. I have two Polar Expresses that goes around. One for the tree and one that I volunteer for a model train display. But... But all that said, this is definitely one of Lionel's biggest um, selling points when it comes to selling general model trains. Because they sell to collectors, they sell to people who are just getting into the hobby. And it's definitely expected to see, and it's definitely great to see that Lionel is celebrating such a massive product line that they've been selling for its 20th anniversary. And of course, we also have the countless expansion train sets, model cars, or anything that Lion that Lionel basically made new practically every year, even though it never appeared in the movie itself. Basically extending a Polar Express um, extended universe, so to say, uh, so to speak. So it'll be pretty interesting to see what Lionel has to offer in this catalog, but judging on the cover, they are recreating one of the famous scenes. I'm probably guessing based on the North Star, the Northern Lights and the mountains, um, this is probably going to be close to where they're going through the mountains, going up that little spiral towards the middle of the movie, but also apologies if not all my sentences make sense. I just got up after, again, two all-nighters back-to-back, so I apologize if not all my sentences might make sense, but I'm just giving my initial opinions on everything I see in this catalog, and I'm going to say at least, hmm, well, first of all, based on the logo, there's probably going to be some sort of 20th anniversary Polar Express um, dedicated set, probably something with the O scale set because we have the accurate Berkshire right on the cover. So they're probably going to be doing something with that. Hopefully they bring back the Golden Polar Express. That's what they had for the 10 year anniversary. And there might be, I'm going to say at least one, some sort of variation of the Polar Express set, maybe with the existing mold that they have. So let's open the catalog and have a look. And right off the bat, we already have a dedicated Polar Express engine, this time blue instead of gold or silver. It it looks pretty good, I must say. I don't think that's supposed to be the same blue or same shade of blue as the coaches, 
but I guess it kind of reminds me of kind of like what they were going for with the cover with the blue sky, the blue night sky over here, and it's a really nice touch. I mean, it kind of looks like the blue comet from a distance, or at least that's the closest thing that looks like in real life with the combination of blue and silver, but they made it work pretty good. And I think it's actually multi-tone blue. I don't know if that's supposed to look like that in real life, but I'm guessing it's supposed to be some sort of special finish that they apply in the engine to make it look two-tone, depending on how you look at it. And that is a really cool aspect that I don't think there are a lot of all trains that have that particular feature. So that is a really nice touch on that engine in particular. And right off the bat, we have the Milwaukee Road. So, very nice to see some representation of the Hiawatha. So, right off the bat, I'm guessing, I remember in um, either, I want to say about a year ago, or something like that, Lionel made O-scale versions of Alco PA, sorry, Alco FAs, that were based on classic post-war train sets. And part of me wonders if this is a continuation of that trend, where they take classic O-gauge models, or even some pre-war models, like the Hiawatha right here, and then turn them into O-scale. Now, that would be a very interesting trend, especially as Lionel is also going towards more fantasy schemes, but it would also be nice to see them, I guess, kind of revamp some classic pre-war or post-war engines, preferably those that have a real-life basis, since not only are you appealing to something that you formerly did as a model train company, but you also have the realism aspect, because... It's an iconic engine in itself. This is one of the, the Milwaukee Road's first streamliners. And also one of the handful of streamlined Atlantics. You do not see too many 442s for streamlined purposes. I also never knew that the tender had five axles. So that's interesting. Also on the top, we have... I guess we all kind of caught... We all kind of saw this coming. Lionel making heritage units of the CSX um, heritage unit program. I guess it was a good call for Lionel to start with the seaboard system because at a distance, it does kind of look like YN2 because you have the fade works really well with the gray because that's basically what the YN2 livery was. You had yellow on diagonal, then blue, and then the rest of it was gray. So very nice to start off with seaboard system. So this way you put in something that's considered good among the rail fans when it comes to heritage units on the top. And for those who may not catch it, it may just look like a regular YN2 unit. Also, that we also have a hotbox, which is an interesting feature on this Santa Fe box car. Then we have a 460. I'm not sure if they had that in the previous years, but judging on the headline, I'm thinking it's a new model. And we also have some graffitied freight cars, probably for what looks like a short line over here. So nice seed line, I'll giving some respect to the, or at least some recognition to the smaller railroads as well. That's another trend that they've been working on lately that is very cool of them to do. And starting off, we have the Erie Triplex. Now, this is a particularly interesting model because they actually advertised this about a month before this catalog came out. Lionel actually released a dedicated Vision Line catalog right here under 2023, specifically to go over the Triplex because it's the newest thing that they have in the catalog. So, once again, if you would like to check out the descriptions, feel free to pause the video and look at all the text that we have over here, because I'm sorry, but I'm not taking the time to read all that, or all the prices for that matter, which I'm thinking brand new triplex, it's definitely going to be up there. But, anyways, we have three Erie engines. Oops. Oh, actually, this one has a name. That's nice. I don't know if there were any... It's probably going to be a common trend on my end to say this. I don't know if there are any triplexes that were named in real life, or if that's something that Lionel introduced. But it's nice to see that Lionel is picking up on these, I guess, lesser known engines if they are a little bit different. Like if this engine specifically has a name. But someone in the comments can probably fact check me on that later of whether any of the triplexes had a name or not. But other than that, we also have a blank Erie triplex where the boiler is painted black along with the rest of the engine. And then we also have the Rio Grande triplex. This is one of the fantasy liveries, the first ones of the sort, um, with a green boiler and the Rio Grande logo on the tender. Now, this is particularly interesting because even though the Rio Grande never ordered triplexes, it was only the Erie 
and then the Virginia with their variant. But the Rio Grande probably would have been a railroad that could have purchased it, seeing how they had a lot of Malays and other articulated on the roster, not around the same time as the Triplex in the 1910s, but later on, like the 20s, 30s, and 40s. So had the Triplex been more successful, I could have definitely seen it on a mountainous railroad like the Rio Grande. And I already know that the Heist server is going to have a field day over this, especially with the boilers being green. And then we have the Fantasy Triplex with Halloween. Um, I'm not sure why they're applying seasonal Halloween themes to Vision Line Legacy engines. I mean, the glow-in-the-dark aspect is pretty cool, but with all due respect, I don't see a lot of people buying this when compared to something more accurate like Eerie, especially for something that's Halloween themed. I mean, that's from what I understand, or at least from what I've observed, not as many people are not as many people celebrate Halloween as much when compared to Christmas, which is right around the corner. And I guess it's a little bit more of a wholesome holiday rather than being spooky for about a month. So, other than that, we also have the Virginian Triplex that I mentioned earlier. Technically, the Virginian Triplex had four axles on the rear instead of two, but that's just Lionel using the same mold. I'll let him pass for this one. It still looks good. The lettering looks really nice. The number looks pretty good, too. And then we also have another railroad that, like the Rio Grande, never rostered a Triplex, but definitely could have, because the Northern Pacific went through a lot of mountainous regions in, I guess, lower Montana and North Dakota, and they also had a lot of articulated engines on the roster. And this one looks especially nice on a triplex. I mean, even though the three sets of wheels may look kind of odd for the average rail fan, it's not a common wheel arrangement. But they still managed to make the triplex look very nice with this comp with this combination of black, white, and red. It it just works, I must say. I I probably have to say I would prefer this over the uh, Rio Grande triplex as well. Maybe even the Erie one. And then we have, oh, ho, ho, an entire Eerie Vision triplex set going into each pairing of O-scale boxcars. This one I have to see the price. A whopping $4,000 for this entire set. But with those $4,000, you get a brand new Eerie Vision triplex along with a whopping 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 cars in a train set. Wow, that is one of the largest sets I've ever seen Lionel make. I mean, it's probably worth every penny because very few train sets are advertised to have 15 cars or anything more than 10. Now, granted, if you go to a model train display, especially with all the pros, and you get vision line engines like this, you could see... 20 or 30 car trains easily, but for Lionel to offer a set that starts with 15 cars with a Triflex, you know this is definitely a powerful engine. Probably so going so far to say that this is probably the most powerful engine that Lionel has ever made in their 124 years of existence. This is, and rightfully so, because it has three sets of driving wheels. That is massive. I mean, it's up there for the price, but you are getting O-scale everything. This is the top of the top that Lionel has to offer. And once again, great detailing on the cars, too. And they all look time period accurate. I mean, this is supposed to take place in like the early 1900s, 1910s. And you still have some of the older styles of boxcars over here. Lesser known companies advertising on the boxcars. It's a very interesting feel that you don't see um, too often with... I guess, more common train sets that Lionel offers. Next, we have Legacy Steam with the classic diagram going over the brass model, all the internal components, and all that stuff. And starting off, we have the Berkshires. I guess a little bit of a... Oh, my bad. Oops. Um, I guess a little bit of a precursor to the Polar Express because the Polar Express is a Berkshire. So might as well start off with that. And very interestingly, instead of, I guess it would have been too obvious to start with um, Pierre Marquette 1225. Oh, wait, there it is. It's down there. <laughs> but I guess it would have been too obvious to start with 1225 for the Berkshires. So they start with realism, 
and start with 755 instead of 765. Very interesting choice from Lionel. Maybe that just has to do with being um, number accurate. If they're going to offer something that's slower than 765. With all that said, I'm surprised they didn't go for 759 because I think that engine is also in preservation. But 765 is definitely the more famous of the two. And it's nice to see that Lionel is offering... I would think Lionel probably offered 765 in O scale sometime in the past. I think it's a late... Sorry, the early 2010s. But I don't know if this is a re-release or updated version or if it's basically... Yeah, like I said earlier, re-releasing an earlier model. And then we have this. Hmm, Nickel Plate Limited 777. Now, I don't think there were any Berkshires that were painted in this livery in real life, but from a distance, it looks like the Reading Crusader, but I don't think that's what they were going for. I think they're trying to focus maybe a little bit more on the Alco PA, or at least the livery that the Alco PAs wore while in passenger service for the Nickel Plate. So this is a very interesting, um, I guess, experiment for Lionel to take a diesel livery and put it on a steam engine for that same railroad. I'm also not sure if there was a triple seven on the roster. If so, that would be very nice because that is a lucky number. But I must say it's, I think it's the silver smoke box that kind of, they probably could have painted the headlight over here black, like what they did with 765. And maybe it would have worked a little bit better, but I feel it might be a little bit of too much silver on the front, especially when you compare that to whatever's going on down here with some sort of Photoshop of making it look um, silver along the way. I don't really know how this is going to... I honestly don't know how the finished product of this is going to come out. Um, I mean, I guess I'll just have to wait and see for the Eric's Train review or anyone else who's going to purchase this just to see what it looks like but yeah it is very interesting but not one of my favorites but definitely out there and then we have a complete computer rendering of these three engines which technically they're Berkshires as well but they have different features especially with the number plates so we have CNO 2765 Detroit Toledo and Ironton 705 which interestingly doesn't have a lot going on with the front it kind of looks a little bit more like Polar Express. And then we have the classic Pierre Marquette 1225. I'm just going to assume this is a re-release because like 765, it's a very famous engine. And it's probably had several releases in the past. But this is going to be um, a bit of a hot take on my end. But seeing how Polar Express is in the movie, I feel that they should release a 1225 with this kind of front to make it look more accurate to not only the O-Gage starter set that they have, but also a little bit more accurate to the Polar Express that was used in the movie. Because in the movie, they don't really have the 1225 number boards on the top over here. If people see something like this, in my opinion, it's more likely to resonate, oh, Polar Express, in a way. But that's just my opinion. We'll see if Lionel releases a Polar Express model with this. And it appears they're saving the Polar Express models for later. They're probably going to be dedicating an entire section on its own. Because up next we have a very hefty 2882. With incredibly long tenders as well. This is probably up there with one of the longest Lionel engines that they ever produced. I mean, I remember recently they made um, Alleghenies, if I remember correctly. But this is a lot longer than Allegheny and much more wheels too. I don't really know if there's that much um, attention to these larger gets given to these larger models too. So it's nice to see Lionel going into these lesser known uh, types of steam engines as well. Especially, look at the size of that water tender over there too. I'm impressed that's only six axles. And other than that, we have CNO, 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 and CNO on the left. And to the right, we have Rio Grande, RFMP, Union Pacific, and Union Pacific. All of which, except RFMP, all of which being um, railroads that definitely could have rostered the. I think with the emphasis on CNO, I'm guessing CNO was probably the only one that rostered them, but I could definitely see Rio Grande and Union Pacific purchasing these engines too. And it's nice to see that they chose tenders that uh, correspond with their home railroads. Although I don't really know what the reasoning is for RFMP 
for this particular engine because to my knowledge, I don't think they rostered any articulated, but it's pretty interesting, I'll admit. Next, we have the 460. Starting off with Jersey Central 185, in a livery that looks like the Blue Comet, but the Blue Comet, to my knowledge, I don't think any moguls, um, sorry, I don't know if the 460 is a mogul or not. Again, my, it's been a long day, but I mean, it looks pretty good on the engine. The smoke box works well with the rest of the colors, I guess. Let me go down here for the New York Central and Hudson River. Now, this is one of the predecessors to the New York Central, and you do not see it in modeling too often, but the shade of blue along with black goes very well with the white wheels, as well as the tender. I'm not sure if they based this off of 999 per se, but it just looks... Yeah, I'm going to say it's my favorite of the bunch, and it's also highlighting a lesser-known railroad, because over here we have the slightly more modern version, the New York Central itself, with a lower-placed a with a lower placed headlight, and much more standard by comparison. We also have Northern Pacific. Once again, looks amazing with the red, white, and black. This time with a, um, even so, it looks a little bit more modern by comparison when compared to other Northern Pacific engines. And then we also have Western Pacific down here. Not really sure if Western Pacific gets too many models per se, especially when it comes to lesser known steam engines like this. Again, I'm not a Western Pacific modeler, so I don't know how accurate it is to the real life counterpart, but... It's nice to see Lionel giving some attention to these railroads, once again, especially this one. Next, we have the Royal Blue Line by the Baltimore and Ohio. This is one of the premier passenger trains of the B&O that ran between Jersey City, or New York as they advertised it, all the way down to Washington, D.C., along their main line. Pretty nice to see one of the earliest incarnations of those uh, train sets as well. And that is a very interesting setup that they have at the doors. I believe this is a brand new model of either a new model of early age pasture coaches, or they might've modified it from a one because I'm not sure how many of them have that kind of doorway in the middle where it's kind of pushed in. It almost reminds me of the coaches that they have, I guess in Europe on some of the Pullmans, if I remember correctly, but I'm going to have to research the coaches for this one. That will be a very unique feature that you do not see commonly on pasture cars, where the door is kind of recessed in to the doorway for the coaches. I mean, you have a lot of very nice lining for the engine as well, but I'm sorry to say I'm more intrigued by the coaches than the engine. <laughs> but, yeah, all new products. Ain't that a fact. Finally, we have the, well, not finally, but next we have the Milwaukee Road Hiawatha. Very nice coaches, very nice engine, and very good choice for a Lionel anniversary unit because the Hiawatha is already orange already. You have a lot of, I guess, debates of whether a certain shade of orange is more yellow or more red. So might as well slightly adjust that shade of orange to make it Lionel and might as well shade that black to be blue for Lionel and to adjust the silver as well from white to silver. But this is a fantasy engine that works. That is a great combination of colors. They tw they tweaked it just the right amount, so this way it's a great combo, essentially. Again, apologies if not all my sentences make sense today, but this is a very, very good fantasy model that specifically highlights Lionel. In fact, that's probably one of my all-time favorites, um, Lionel-specific engines, because... I remember about 10 years ago, they released a all-silver Berkshire that had the Lionel logo, but it wasn't really... I don't really know if it had a lot in terms of colors. I'm more of a livery kind of guy. I focus a lot more on how colorful something looks, how well it looks by comparison. And this is definitely a combination of great color pattern and kind of true to the original as well. But that is something that works. Great job, Lionel. Huh, that's odd. Two Hiawathas back-to-back, -back, even though they're pretty much identical sets. Oh, I see what they did here. One of them focuses more on a red line through the coaches, and the other is what I assume is the more... Is that the original one? 
I'm not really sure. I mean, I guess so, because they have the uh, number plates. Well, either numbers or actual names, which is kind of cut off here. But you have numbers or names in the middle, which I guess is more reminiscent of the engine itself, where it's Hiawatha in the middle. But very interesting. Two different variants of the passenger coaches. Not too common that you see that with the Milwaukee Road. I guess it had to be two different um, generations of the coaches. Again, I'll double check that, but very nice, I must say. And I guess the only differences here with the engines is where the Milwaukee Road has the Hiawatha logo on the tender or not. What? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, if it works, um, I don't know what to say because, dang, um, well, this certainly reminds me of, yeah, they had to take inspiration from that, um, Milwaukee Road video where it's based on Big Bill's Hell because the first line of that video is, um, Leap You, Chicago, and Northwestern. That's what that feels like here. Because they covered a well-known Chicago and Northwestern streamliner, but instead of making an entirely new model that was based on the Chicago Northwestern, they said, nah, uh we're putting it on the Milwaukee Road, Hiawatha. It's all about the Milwaukee Road. And they also made all the passenger coaches Hiawatha coaches, but with the Chicago Northwestern livery. To be honest, I don't really know if the engine works all that much. But it's incredibly hilarious of what they're trying to say to the CNW with this one. And I don't want to say rightfully so, but it makes sense that they'll be doing this against the CNW because the Chicago and Northwestern was the number one fierce rival of the Milwaukee Road. So, I mean, the Chicago and Northwestern ended up lasting longer anyways, but that's a whole story in itself. But they got the livery right. But the thing that's mostly throwing me off is that because they decided to base it off the Milwaukee Road A-Class, it looks way too compressed. I mean, technically, it's not the right amount of driver wheels, too. I mean, that's kind of thrown me off as well. But a thing that really sticks out is that it's way too short by the comp by comparison. The Hudson's... Where does CNW... Anyways, the CNW uh, Streamliners, they were much taller by comparison. I want to say about a third times higher than the A-Class. And it makes sense, because it was a later style of Streamliners, too. It was a later model. So it had more... Slightly more advanced um, steam technology, I guess, where they had more wheels, more space in the boiler. And I believe MTH made a model of the, an accurate model of the CNW Streamliner 2. But I think Lionel knew what they were doing here. They knew that by putting it on a Milwaukee Road engine, it was not going to be as accurate to the real thing. But they were just trying to send a larger message. It's all about the Milwaukee Road. <laughs> or maybe not. Um, I mean, I guess this is another example where it kind of works because, again, seaboards, first of all, it's nice that Lionel recognized the seaboard heritage unit. What am I saying? The seaboard, the seaboard um, streamliner, not heritage unit. Um... That's another thing, too. CSX, where's our Seaboard Heritage Unit? It better be in this one. But, um... um first of all, it's very nice to see that Lionel uh, recognized Seaboard's Streamliner, because I don't think there are many uh, models that are based on this engine. It's just awkward to have the first Streamliner that represents Seaboard Airlines be based on the Milwaukee Road A class. But... And... I don't recall if the coaches had the same paint scheme as the Seaboard Airline one, but it works. It's all about keeping the same colors, and to be honest, I kind of prefer the multicolor ones for the coaches when compared to just silver or just one, maybe two color schemes. But I guess in this case, especially since the Seaboard Streamliner is especially colorful, especially towards the wheels, it could be seen as a little bit too much for the coaches, though, since the coaches are meant to be more standard. It's what most people are seeing, I guess. I just noticed in most historic photos, the coaches are usually one, maybe two colors, three if you're lucky. But I guess they don't want to be spending too much on something as standard as a coach. But once again, the livery looks great. Not really sure if it works too much on a 
Milwaukee Road A class, essentially. But I mean, I could see the reasoning behind it because they had the shovel nose. It's very similar to a lot of streamliners that were built. I want to say in the 30s, probably late 30s, if I remember correctly. Kind of looks a little bit more like a diesel, but again, I don't know if the A class is the best model to do that because it's short by comparison and it has a. I think the A class was the only streamlined Atlantic, the only 442 when compared to the more traditional 462 or 464. And another one. Of course, we have the Union Pacific Overlander. Sorry, guys, this one doesn't work well. It. It doesn't work well when compared to the other A classes, and it doesn't work well when compared to the other, um, what do you call it? the other Overland liveries that um, Lionel has applied over the years. Man, am I so glad I did not check Discord before looking at the catalog, because I can tell a lot of people are going to be having a lot of reactions to the engines in this catalog, and we're not even halfway through yet. From what I could understand. And we're already up to 30 minutes in the video. But man, these are some very interesting engines. And I think with the molding too, I just noticed. It still has the um, Hiawatha nameplate in the middle. So, yeah, that's pretty interesting. But the thing with trying to keep to the dimensions with the Overland livery is that, especially since the boiler goes up from the cab, you have, I feel the brown is a little bit too much on the side. You want to focus more on the red and the yellow, but I figured Lionel just threw this in for the lulls. They figured if we're going to do something like Seaboard Airline on an A-Class, then you better believe we're doing the fantasy livery of all time. The fantasy livery that we apply to everything. The one and only Union Pacific Overlander. And just like that, we're on to the Legacy Diesels. I guess they figured, all right, three fantasy schemes on the Milwaukee Road is enough. But I still find that incredibly hilarious how they specifically chose the Chicago Northwestern Fantasy to be right after the Milwaukee Road one. So on to the diesels, we have much more accurate GP9, starting off with the very less known Minneapolis and St. Louis. I'm guessing this is one of the uh, Class 2s, I think? Either a small Class 1 or a Class 2 that existed up until the 50s, but... I'm not really sure if they're known for their GP9s all that much, so great job on Lionel for covering that. We also have a purple Norfolk and Western GP9. I don't know how many, um, oops, I don't know how many models there are of this particular style of NW. Actually, oh no, they didn't have the NW livery because I question that because some Norfolk and Western GP9s had the NW logo on the front, while others didn't. But I guess it has to do with standardization, but oh well. Other than that, we have the classic Pennsylvania GP9, along with the GP9B, which is one of a handful of B units that Lionel made that wasn't a um, F unit, I guess. Other than that, we also have the classic Banger and Rustock, so very nice selection. Now we also have Conrail, Union Pacific, Penn Central with Conrail patches, pretty nice, and a Conrail and Union Pacific GP9B. Now, I'm a little bit more familiar with the Union Pacific GP9Bs, but I'm not so sure if Conrail had any of these. I'm also... I don't think this is Lionel's fault, but just in the case of EMD, why would you still have the radiators over here if it's a B unit? Because, especially now, most B units are slugs. Usually have the... I don't know if it's the engine removed, but they usually have this part removed. That's... And sometimes even still have the cab, but that's usually an easy way to distinguish an engine and a B unit of sorts. But, yeah, they look good overall. Although, I don't know if Lionel was basing this particular Conrail model on something that might have been prototypical. Because Conrail is known for... I guess it had to be based on an earlier model, because they have the more well-known Conrail logo over here. But they don't have the logo in this one. They just have Conrail lettering over the front, but they only have the blue paint scheme. So, in a way, it looks more similar to... The Conrail patch when compared to the more iconic Conrail logo. So, I guess that's Lionel's way of representing a lesser known one off unit of sorts. So, good job. Next, we have the ES44, or the Jivo, as they call it. We have BNSF, Canadian Pacific, interestingly, no beaver for this one. Not sure why they didn't include it here. CSX, Norfolk Southern, 
as well as the new livery of Union Pacific. Pretty good. And I'm guessing, based on the cover, the very next page is going to include at least three CSX Heritage units. Am I right? Well, we have some Heritage units, but not CSX ones. We have Norfolk Southern Heritage units. I don't think these were the ones that were repainted last year, but it's nice to see them re-release them again. We have Central Georgia, Lehigh Valley, Mona, sorry, Monona, Mo, Monongahela, I think, Norfolk Western, and Pennsylvania. Not sure if the logo is a little bit too large on the N&W unit. There we go. Now we got all the CSX Heritage units. But interestingly, they highlighted the handlebars around the front cab. I don't think the um, I don't think the handlebars are yellow in real life, but it's actually better touch than what they look like in real life. I mean, I would prefer if they had these yellow handbars. It it would at least give them a little bit of color when compared to just blue and yellow. But of the bunch, it it also kind of reminds me of. I guess the early Lionel CSX Heritage units that they tried to do, like, I want to say in the late 2000s when Lionel, after seeing the Pacific Heritage unit program, they tried to make some of their own custom Heritage units for CSX and Norfolk Southern, although they ended up being nothing like what the finish, what the current result would look like today. It kind of reminds me of that, especially with the B&O, because the thin lines of yellow on the front matches up pretty well with the thin lines of yellow for B&O, but... I guess with that said, of the five here, in terms of models, the my favorite one is actually going to be B&O. And that's very ironic, considering that B&O is actually my least favorite of the bunch in real life. So, good job for making me change my opinions on my CSX um, Heritage Unit ranking list. Next, we have the SD45. Very interesting. This has a little bit of a fan base of its own because of the extended radiators toward the back as well as a, I think, a different kind of prime mover as well that had more cylinders when compared to the SD40. But other than that, we have Santa Fe in one of their early yellow and blue liveries. Delaware and Hudson has a little fan base of its own. Very nice to see that back. Rio Grande, Redding, Frisco, and Southern Pacific. Very nice selection of railroads for this very well-known model. Next, we have the E6. Very interesting... Um... What is that with the seaboard unit? That looks like a, it says seaboard, but it looks more like Florida East Coast. I mean, really quickly, BNO looks good, Southern looks great, Milwaukee Road looks good, but what's going on down here? Is that some sort of see through unit? Oh, I guess I don't think that was the livery that they used for a seaboard for the E6. It might have been, but super best. Huh. Paying tribute to the locomotives displayed at the 3940 World's Fair. Interesting. The clear body panels would provide a few. So it is. Very interesting. Again, I have to look into the livery of the seaboard units particularly. This one looks more like Florida East Coast than seaboard, but that is a very nice tribute to show the internal components as it's running because you see that advertised on the front pages of the certain sections of Lionel Catalog all the time. But very rarely do you see an engine where you can actually see the internal components like this. So, very creative, I must say. Of course, we have the classic Rock Island E-units over here in slightly different letterings and colors because Rock Island was just a huge mix of different types of engines over the years, as well as this classic Rock Island commuter coaches over here to go with not only the E-units, but also with practically anything else that was labeled Rock Island in the 70s. And then we also have... City of San Francisco, not really sure how it mixes in with um, Rock Island, but I guess they just had to fit it in somewhere. Looks great as always. And then we have the classic CB&Q. Now, I don't know if the Burlington represented or rostered any E6s particularly, but I know what they were going for with this one. They were trying to represent the much more well-known E5, which I believe all 10 of the E5s were purchased by the Burlington route at one point. And... That's definitely what they were trying to go for with this. Not and they, they're giving a little bit of special treatment here because not only do they have the E units, but they also have a dedicated set of classic Burlington, uh, I think, Pullman or Bud coaches. But it goes along very well with the engine. It's a great continuation of sil of silver. So good job with this set. Next we have the SW8. 
now representing the Detroit Edison, along with the Erie Lackawanna, Reading and Northern, Texas and Pacific, U.S. Air Force, and Chicago and Northwestern. So, nice lineup, nice to see some representation some, from some smaller lines, too. Next, we have the U-28C. Not too often that you see some uh, GEs um, in model railroading. They usually get overshadowed by the much more popular EMD models for the past few years, too. So, I can already tell this catalog is going to be a combination of people being confused and angry with the fantasy Milwaukee roads, but overjoyed to see some GE U-boats. Because this is definitely appealing to all the GE fans out there, too. And I'm going to have to agree, GE is kind of underrated when it comes to their U-boats. You don't see too many of them in preservation. You don't see too many of them in model form. So, it's nice to see Lionel representing them with... Some of the best roads they worked on, namely Conrail, Louisville, Nashville, Pennsylvania, which is an early one, Penn Central, Center Pacific, Union Pacific, and Seaboard System. Nice lineup. Now we have, I'm not sure why, did, why they put this in the diesel section instead of after the Milwaukee uh, fantasy schemes, because that was the last thing in the steam section. But we have a typical North, sorry, typical nickel plate road, Berkshire Freight, with 779 leading. Actually, is that a Berkshire? Yeah, that's a Berkshire. My bad. And I guess the main thing with this is that it also has a hotbox reefer to cars in, which I I don't know how that's going to work. I don't know if that's going to light up, uh, produce some sort of smoke, actually cause a hotbox, but I guess we'll see when this gets released. I don't know if they had this technology before, but pretty interesting to see it now, I guess. Um. Okay, I was going to say, if they were just... There's the lead unit over there. So we have a glow-in-the-dark legacy set. Very interesting concept to make an entire legacy set. One, fantasy, and two, glow-in-the-dark. Hmm. I mean, it's a very nice combination of red and green. It does a good job at displaying the glow-in-the-dark aspect, I must say. It's interesting how they have the B unit as well. This kind of reminds me of some of the late 2000s, um, and sometimes late 2010s, um, O-Gage sets that Lionel used to make. So I guess it's also a continuation of the trend of, I guess, bringing more O-Gage stuff to O-Scale. This particular set wasn't in O-Gage before, but it's a similar concept as what they would do with their O-Gage sets. Illinois Central City of Miami. Now that is something you do not see in model form often, or in any form. Not a lot of people know about the city of Miami when compared to more famous trains on the IC, like the city of New Orleans or the Green Diamond. But I want to say this was one of a handful of streamliners that had a different livery when compared to the rest of the streamliners in the rest of the railroad. Because I guess in the later years, the city of Miami would just have typical brown and orange liveries. But this one looks... You would be mistaken to think that this was probably an early Union Pacific streamliner because of the shade of yellow, or how, I guess it's like light orange, but very close to yellow. And very interesting that they don't put a lot of emphasis on the engine as of yet, probably because it's just a computer rendering, but this is a very nice set, I must say. And again, it's all about giving the um, lesser known, or less, yeah, the lesser known engines, pasture sets, railroads, giving them some recognition, I guess. Very interestingly, we also have, sorry, I'm a little stuffed up, but yeah, I'm thinking they're definitely bringing some themes that they had in O-Gage over to O-Scale, because for the first time, we have O-Scale Looney Tunes freight cars. This time, not painted in a bunch of different colors, but we have some Looney Tunes decals on the side of the box cars over here. I guess it works well. If you look for it close enough, you'll be sure to see it. Pretty respectable, I guess. And then we also have the pasture cars, the same ones that they had for the Baltimore and Ohio. Once again, with that recessed doorway, you don't see that too common with American coaches, so it's very interesting to see that here. Then you also have freight cars, half of which have a hot box. Interesting to see Strasburg has their own box car down here too. I don't think they had one back in the day, but I guess it kind of works. Then we have Union Pacific World War II box cars. 
with a bunch of World War II stamps on the box cars. There was a meme about this particular poster, but it was photoshopped. So, oh well. Next we have some Freight Sounds PS1s. Very interesting that they have a Golden Burlington box car because that was in particular reference to 5632, which was painted gold uh, for a time while it was on excursion run. So it's nice seeing them giving a little nod to that. You also have some very big lettering for these box cars over here. This is a nice box car too. It shows a route map of the system. That's always been one of my favorite kinds of freight cars, even though it wasn't accurate. And I don't even know if Lionel made them, but there used to be these hoppers or freight cars where it would just show the entire route map of the railroad on that box car or freight car. Those are my favorite types of graphics on a freight car because it shows you where it's going from, to and from, or at least where it belongs to. Next, we have some tanker cars, TOFC cars, most of which were REA, covered hoppers, great weathering on the hoppers over here, especially that Illinois Central one over here. Next, we have some cabooses. Remember, no accidents for August. Good luck with that. Steel box cars. We're not really sure why this one is painted green. Some tank cars in here as well. Hoppers. Does this mean what I think it's going to mean? Oh, shoot. Oh, man. Oh, man. This is a Rock Island Doodlebug in the top left. But specifically, the Rock Island Rockets, which was a paint scheme that was applied to the Doodlebugs to make them look streamlined. Now, I don't really know if I'll be covering the um, streamlined. I'm sorry, uh, the Rock Island technically did have a streamlined-ish Doodlebug, but they just gave it something like side skirting on the bottom and nothing on the front, which is eh, not really streamlined per se when compared to other ones but does this mean we could get based on o-gauge i'm not expecting it to be streamlined but this could mean we could get an o-gauge version of the mighty 4663 aka the pennsylvania streamlined doula bug i'm really hoping we get that here i'm really hoping we get the pensy streamlined doodle bug even if not streamlined at least some sort of representation in here but other than that, we have the Lionel lines, a classic post-war set, and they even brought back one of the classic post-war models. I actually uh, purchased this one from a swap meet. It was like a 1949 model, if I remember correctly. Um, I actually have it right next to me as I'm recording uh, right now. Let me see what the, the Lionel 2025, as a matter of fact. And I don't know if that... No, it's not the same number per se, but it's very interesting to see... Lionel brought back a full-on post-war mold for this set. Very interesting from Lionel. Next we have Bluetooth and the remote. Oh, we have Berkshires here. Okay, I have a feeling they're saving Polar Express for the end. Um, because now we're up to... They're really hinting to it a lot because these this is the same Berkshire model that they use for the Polar Express... But to be fair, I think they've been uh, releasing them as singles lately for Lion Chief Plus 2.0 releases. So we have Nickel Plate, Pierre Marquette, CNO, and Louisville and Nashville. So interesting to see those lineups. They look pretty good. LN looks especially nice with the yellow outlining. Although I'm not too big of a of a fan of the yellow of the silver smoke box for the O gauge ones. And all right, we got the Genesis and the Metro North Heritage units too, with 208 and Conrail, along with 209 and Amtrak 164, which technically is kind of a heritage unit. It's a crossover from the 40th anniversary unit, but 184 was painted in Phase 5. Well, this one was repainted in Phase 4, even though it doesn't have the 40th anniversary lettering. So very nice to see some more representation of the Genesis. And it's nice to see that Lionel is not only representing... Um, lesser known models like what we saw earlier with small short lines but they're also very up to date with current events because I think the most recent of these was Conrail because that was released I want to say two maybe three months ago and they already have an engine for it for the catalog great job of making these Lionel I mean I prefer 208 a little bit more but 
once again, it's great to see some heritage units. And, oh, we don't have a Pennsylvania Zulu bug. We have B&O, that's pretty nice. Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, which is red and yellow, pretty standard. East Broad Top, that was based on a narrow gauge dual bug, but nice to see some representation. Gulf Mobile in Ohio, New York Central, Northern Pacific, and the Rock Island. So it's nice to see that Lionel's still accurate to the real life paint schemes, at least, of the, of what do you call, the um, Lionel, sorry, of the, of the railroads that rostered these doodle bugs. You have the differences like red and yellow versus red and white, depending on the railroad. So at least they notice the differences with that, even if the model or the mold itself isn't based on, you know, isn't based on the exact counterpart. Like these were usually rostered by Brill, for example, but it still looks good. It still looks good. A little bit disappointed that they did not have the almighty Penzi 4663 then maybe it is a good thing, because if they would have used this, and they just would have used the same flat mold, which, technically, I think there's a Rail King model, I think, of basically exactly what happened, what I'm describing now. They had 4663, they had the paint scheme that it was painted in, but they had a standard mold like this, so it wasn't streamlined, and I feel for 4663, that's something that has to be streamlined, in my opinion. Next, we have the Frozen Train. Yay. I mean, I'm not really that big of a fan of this series, but at least they gave more respect to Olaf than the Disney princesses, so that's respectable. And they give it a very interesting turquoise for most of it, instead of just light blue. Next we have John Deere, this time using a 242 starter set instead of a 080 or RS3 like previous models. This time with a very big barn for John Deere. And a different caboose, too. Next, we have Looney Tunes. Not really... I don't remember if they changed up the engine or not. This might be a new decal for the set. The boxcars might be different as well, but... That is a uh, pretty interesting um, add-on for, for the house, I guess. And... Huh. So they bring back the post for set, and they label it as Prairie Freight. And put the all-new product sticker on it, too. Oh. Huh. I feel like there's a bit of a gap between the tender and the engine, but that just might be a rendering issue. But it's great to see Lionel re-releasing some post-war models. That's not even an anniversary year. I guess it's a nice little... Um, I don't know if it's compensation for all the Polar Express uh, merch that they'll be celebrating, I guess, for the 20th anniversary, but it's definitely nice to see. Next, we have some more 262s. This time for Santa Fe, Pennsylvania, and U.S. Army, all using the same 2025 mold. I feel like they should have... It probably would have made more sense to wait another year to release this mold. So this way, they're releasing the Lionel Lions 2025 in 2025. But that's just my opinion. It's, it's still cool nonetheless to see this back a year early, I guess. But... Of the bunch, I'm definitely going to say the original line lines because that's classic. Nothing can really beat that per se. I mean, these look pretty good, but it just doesn't match the original. Then you have the more standard 242 starter set. I believe this was part of the line lines uh, starter set as well. Then we also have that in Burlington route, as well as New York Central Pacemaker, very interestingly. And of the bunch, I'm going to say Burlington is probably my favorite because it's a nice combination of colors. Next, we have some FTs, this time in Pennsylvania, New Pacific, Lionel Lines, Santa Fe, and MKT, or the Texas Special, as it's also known as. Not really sure if the Lionel Lines one really works as well here. I mean, it looks all right, but I'm the bunch of probably going to say the classic Santa Fe, or at least it's a more current incarnation of that one. We also have, for the ET-44s, CSX. BNSF, Rendering Error, and the U.S. Army. Again, I don't think the U.S. Army had any GVOs, so this is kind of an original paint scheme. It, it looks decent, I guess. Next, we have the Speeders, Chessie, CNW, Rock Island, U.S. Army, again, and Area 51. Then we have some pretty interesting Lion L lines coaches, which kind of looks like Long Island for a sec, but now it's just a combination of blue and silver. 
I mean, they say Lionel lines, but I don't know if this is a nod to the blue and silver of the Nickel Plate Road FAs that they were trying to put on the Berkshire earlier. It might be. Although these O-Gage cars are probably going to be dwarfed when compared to the O-Scale Berkshire, if that's the intent. You also have Pennsylvania, silver with the fancy lettering, Union Pacific. Harry Potter box cars, interestingly, instead of a whole set. Interesting that they sold the licensing for this as well, so that's kind of cool, I guess. But then again, I guess it's cheaper to make box cars with graphics when compared to an entire set. Now we have Justice League. We have the Dark Knight, Flash, and a few others. Unfortunately, I don't really know DC superheroes all that much, but these are pretty good box cars. I get, sorry, very, bleh, pretty good freight cars. Disney Dreams Collection with some very high quality paintings on the side of some box cars. Some more Angela Trotta with Lionel Lines post war models on box cars. Barbie 65 had a feel they were probably going to go for that, seeing how popular Barbie was last year with the movie. So nice to see that Lionel's in that um, wave as well. Wizard of Oz, nice 85th anniversary box car over here. And Bob Ross has his own box cars with great paintings. A bit of an icon in itself. Very clever water tower. Yeah, it's nice to see some recognition for some of these for some of these other brands, especially Bob Ross. Wasn't expecting to see this at all. So next we have Mr. Rogers neighborhood. Wow, we have some Mr. Rogers box cars from Lionel. Very interesting, I must say. Then we also have the Chevy Crane and Ford Crane. Okay, I guess. Not really sure what that has to do with cars. Some Budweiser cars. Doesn't really look like it's anything too much since they released a lot of our Budweiser cars earlier. We also have Lenny Lager. Don't know what this is, but I'm guessing it's some sort of root beer of sorts. We also have Winged Angels. I think this was a continuation of what they had from a year or two ago. And then a lot more U.S. Army cars. Some more standard freight cars. Blue Coal, they're a pretty big name in heating. Graffiti box cars. American History, East Broad Top, Western Pacific, and First Continental Congress. Wow, these are some... I must say, I definitely love all the selections that they have for box cars this year. Personalized layout. Twilight Route. Oh, this is all the Halloween stuff. More Halloween O-scale cars. I mean, I guess it kind of works because they're kind of old and that kind of thing, I guess. Given the streamlined Halloween apparel for all the passenger cars over here, as well as the F unit. This F unit looks pretty nice in the Halloween scheme, I must admit. I like it a little bit more than the steam engine here, but good job at that. The Halloween barn, all right. And then we get into Christmas. You see how there's a lot more stuff for Christmas when compared to Halloween? I mean, those are just my observations. But interestingly enough, they have a interesting combination of an EMD FT, and I believe those are post-war streamlined pasture cars, which, again, are kind of dwarfed by the engine, but very interesting to see bringing back some post-war molds, too. Just one surprise after another. And right after that, we have our first dedicated Polar Express, in a very nice maroon. Now, I was expecting them, based on that blue model, to have, well, probably going to have it later on to have blue. It's Again, it's not the same shade of blue as these, but the way the purple or the maroon goes right into the rest of the engine, that is great contrast of silver and gold into maroon, because it's not something that you would expect. It's not a color that's very bold on the Polar Express. It's more blue than maroon, but this engine looks very good with that particular paint scheme. So, oh, we also have some boxcars over here for the 20th anniversary. Here's that blue Berkshire that they had earlier. Here's the other Berkshire. Here's the maroon one. I mean, it looks more standard when compared to this one, which I assume probably has some sort of two-tone special livery or coating applied to it. But I must say, this one looks very nice on the engine. There we go. There is our first Polar Express variant. This time, changing the lettering on the side of the tender. They made the coal gold, and they also added a little logo on the side Well, not side rods, but on the cylinders over here. Pretty nice. And in terms of the coaches, we have a little bit more detail in the coaches themselves, along with the logos. So this way, well, 
For some of them, you can see the characters, while others are simply just the same uh, stencils, I guess. And then we have the Polar Express Genesis. All right. So, I mean, I'm particularly happy about this because in the Northeast region, especially as they cover Metro North, you do see a lot of P-42s and P-32s by that standard. So it's nice to see some modern engines get the Polar Express treatment as well. And I must say, they did a good job with keeping the lines and with respect to, I guess, how the engine kind of curves in towards the front. And then we also have the Polar Express Doodlebug. These are some great uh, selections of Polar Express Fantasy engines. I also just noticed with the Polar Express, the lettering on this tender looks slightly different when compared to what they had over here. I don't know if that's deliberate or not. So we also have the Conductor and Hero Boy. Um, what is this? Uh, hand card, that's what it is. Looks like you're using one of the post-war models, or post-war models for this as well. Pretty interesting choice. And we also have some more freight cars. Personalized 20th anniversary freight car. Some more box cars and accessories. And of course, one more fantasy Hiawatha for the Christmas season. Thank you for choosing a Christmas Hiawatha when compared to a Halloween Hiawatha. You see, see how Christmas is a much larger holiday by comparison? So they knew that doing... They would probably have a better shot making a Christmas Hiawatha when compared to Halloween Hiawatha. And it looks better, too. The white goes pretty well, although I feel like maybe they should have added another line somewhere over here to show where the top of the engine is. So this way it's not white on white. It's not very easy to pick out where the engine is. But other than that, the coaches look pretty good. Nice mix of red and yellow. Next we have some more. Huh. That's a mixed train. Now, that is something you do not see in a lot of O-Gauge sets. A combination of freight and passenger cars on the same consist. And it makes sense that they chose the 460 for this, since you would see a lot of 460s on branch line trains that would have passenger and freight in the same run, just like this. So, good job for uh, giving some sort of recognition to mixed trains. And then we have the... Again, I don't know why they chose the... Post-war O-Gauge cars for an EMD FT. I mean, if you're going to do that, you might as well use either the Alco PAs or if you somehow still have it, the original cast or the original mold for the F units that you had. But I guess it means we have more post-war O-Gauge stuff back, so I'm not really complaining there per se. It's just odd to see something post-war modeled with um, something new, I guess. Of course, we have another Berkshire, another 2025 model, 242, and Jeevo, along some standard passenger cars. They all look pretty good. Some more freight cars, some more artwork. A Lionel Shack, based on the popular Amp Shack. Here's the other Amp Shack, or small Amp Shack station down here. Streetlights. Um... Still available, so this is probably... This is the first. Not sure why they have this from a... I guess it's a way to still kind of sell it. I guess. This is new. Maybe you have Amphletes in there, too. So this is listing a bunch of stuff from previous catalogs, so it's nice to see them here. Just going through these pretty quickly because I technically reviewed them already. I guess they figured these didn't sell as well, so they're just listing them again. There's line base. Still not really sure what it does. Oh, they still have trans they still have transformers over here too. That's nice. Still available American Flyer. Pretty interesting, I must say. Now we have a special offer, Texas Special GP9. That looks pretty good on the engine, I must say. Some more stuff. Triplex. And that is the end of the catalog. You know, with all the fantasy boxcars, all the fantasy Hiawathas, all the... Even the Doodlebugs, I'm... I'm gonna be honest. 
that was probably the best catalog I've ever reviewed on the channel. This is a good one. This is going to bring forth a lot of very interesting takes, a lot of very interesting traditions. In terms of my favorite engine, Steam is going to be... Let's see. For the sake of the Polar Express, favorite for Steam is probably going to be... Let me find it really quick. The Maroon Polar Express. It's not something that you would have expected when compared to previous years, and it's a great way to pay tribute to this very uh, prominent series that Lionel's had. And favorite Diesel? That's... Sadly, it's not going to be any of the Doodlebugs, but... Favorite Diesel of the bunch is probably going to go to... Let me just keep looking on here. Let me try to find and give some last-second reviews on everything. Hmm. I mean, I would consider favorite freight car, but that would be taking way too long. So, for the sake of favorite diesel, Metro North 208. Metro North's first heritage unit. It's nice to see some heritage unit representation in this catalog. So, with all of that said... Very interesting choices for giving some recognition to lesser-known units. Very interesting choices for fantasy paint schemes on the Milwaukee Road, Hiawatha, out of all things. But, yeah, this is definitely one of the best catalogs I've ever reviewed. Definitely the most interesting schemes out of any of the past, I think, three or four that I've reviewed in the past year. And a great way to start off 2024 with the Volume 1 catalog. So, with all of that said, thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like, subscribe for more. And thank you again for watching, for going through this entire catalog. And, yeah, what a catalog. Wow.